this might only matter to about 50 people in the world, but if you care about networking inside data centers, uh, then this video will be for you. Pluribus Networks is here showing us the latest in state-of-the-art software-defined networking for data centers. And uh, I know a few people at Rackspace who will care a lot about this, but maybe not for everybody. Who are you? Um, my name is Sunet Tripathi. I'm the CTO and one of the founders at Pluribus Networks. Um, you know, I come from the world of servers before Pluribus used to work for Sun Microsystem and, you know, did a lot of the server and virtualization into Solaris kernel. Um, and at that point, we kind of, you know, were looking to figure out the world, what it is today the entire racks working as one, network, server, storage, all combined together. So we set out to do that about four years back. So 2010 is when we kind of started doing this. And who are you? Hi, my name is Robert Drost. I'm also a co-founder with Sine of Pluribus Networks and currently also operating as a COO. And my background was also from Sun Microsystems. I worked there through my career starting first in designing high performance processors and then moved up to doing high performance I.O. between chips, and then entire high performance system design for HPC projects for the government and some other petaflop type level projects. And uh, came on to Sun with uh, uh, Sine, sorry, came on to Pluribus with Sine because you know, we found that there was a great opportunity for doing something in the networking to improve the overall data center. Yeah. So uh, let's go up to 30,000 feet for the sure. few people who are still listening to this who don't know anything about databases, um, about, about uh, data center networks. What's the average data center network look like today it, it, you know, when you walk in? What, what do you see and, and what's, what's pushing all the data around, I guess? So the average data center is still the network in a data center is a very close network, right? I mean. This is primarily where you'll see gear from people like Cisco's and Juniper's. And the, the goal of the data center was earlier pushing packets through with different protocols and stuff like that, basically. Um, it's a very disconnected system from server and storage. You typically have a network which runs independently from servers and storage today. So uh, tell me, uh, you know, lay out the industry right now. Uh, we have some of the newer upstarts like Nasira that we've had in here before, and they got bought by VMware, I think. Um, and compare what you're doing to the rest of the market. Because uh, yeah. you know, most people don't know what, data, da what networking is inside a data yeah. center. They've never seen a Cisco box sitting on top of yeah, no, that's a, a great question. Machines. That's a great question. Because I think people have been hearing about the desire to make the network do more, to put things like SDN into it. And what's really unique about Pluribus is that we had the view that the network itself, the boxes that are in fact moving the packets, are a very good place to be doing network programmability and SDN and opening them up to all of the kind of programming and stuff that people have been used to for decades now on the server and networking side. That's sort of why you, know, you got a little chuckle when you said, are we competing with Nicere? Nicere is on the server side. And so people actually can do virtualization, whatever they want inside of the servers, but we felt like the network itself inside of the network deserved to have all of those cool new features. So if I run a data center for let, let's say Walmart or Win, Win Resorts or something like that, because I've seen their data centers are pretty, they're pretty uh, well built out. Mm -hmm. They probably have a, a, a Jupyter box or a Cisco box yeah. sitting on top of uh, 10,000 machines, sure. right? That are running those 10,000 machines and yeah, shuttling data around, right? Typically it ends up being, they have a box in the rack itself, it's called top of the rack switch. So you have a bunch of servers, 20 to 40 servers in a rack, maybe some storage, and you have a switch that connects all of them together and it's the top of the rack switch. Then from top of the rack switch, you have a core network that connects all of this together. And the position where a lot of this is happening is in the rack, right? Because the rack is getting virtualized, rack is getting application aware, and the rack is being orchestrated as one unit, basically, right? So, so where earlier we used to deal with servers and storage and networking separate, you know, OpenStack is a good example. OpenStack is trying to unify all of it, and it wants to make it run as 
one unit, which mm -hmm. means the network really now needs to be similar to server and storage, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of space where NICERA was also playing. And we are all trying to solve the same problem. It's like, you know, in today's world, how do you make this all work together? So what do I need from you guys? Do I need to take my Cisco box on top of each rack and put in uh, a pluribus network box? Or tell me what, so we, what we, I we need to do, do in both. my data centers. We, we make uh, network boxes which are more like server, and these are called server switches. And you can use those, basically, right? And these are all running on Merchant Silicon. There is no custom SIG. And they're all open boxes. Or you can also use some of the boxes coming from Far East, the ODM boxes, what we call uh, the new white boxes of switches, and put our OS on it. The, the, the work we have done is that you know we have integrated some of the systems together, right? So the hardware and software. We might bring together. that slide up that you had. Uh, Actually, the, exactly. Yeah. That would be a. So, so if you look at this picture, um, you know, the, the, the way servers used to be before, right? I'm showing the old style server versus traditional switch, right? Yeah. The old style server, if you notice, the CPU's memory are all controlled by the OS and the NIC itself is sitting on the PCI bus and on the high memory bus and it's trying to deal, the OS is trying to control all, all of it together. The switching on the other hand was built around, if you look at it, um, low speed IO buses, right? They weren't meant for programmability, they were meant for human configuration. Yeah. What Pluribus is trying to do, what, you know, we, our third partner is not here, Ken basically, but between Ken, Robert, and me, what we have tried to do is just replace the NIC by a merchant silicon, both Intel and Broadcom, and keep the programming model in the box still like a server. So we have kept 90% of the server intact, including the operating system. And we just, instead of the NIC, bring a switch chip there. So this box at least looks like a server and behaves like a server, but at the back has 48 10 gig ports and four 40 gig ports to connect the rest of the servers together. And what, what does this mean when we go to this new model? What, what kinds of things happen to the data center? Does our performance get better? Do we get it enables, new capabilities? You know, it both enables higher performance for stuff that you'd be doing anyway, but it also enables uh, a set of features that you just couldn't really get without this kind of tight integration between the server and the switch. One of the most notably is on the server side, that really is a standard server. This isn't sort of a server, a switch that they added, an Intel processor. That doesn't already make it a server. If you wanted to actually run all the standard Linux tools out of the box with no change, right? if you want to be able to just put a CD-ROM loaded and go on that, that actually is something that you need completely standard components. The other part is by having so much bandwidth, you're able to do things on the control plane that otherwise would be impossible, like putting your control plane in the middle of every decision that would affect how the switch chip is moving data around. Hmm. You know, other than the very simple hardware enforced uh, packet comes in and it's just going out another port by layer two or layer three switching, you can actually go in and put C code in front of you know, any of the other decisions that are going on in the network. And that's truly unique. In fact, when people talk about SDN, a lot of times they talk SDN, but underneath the SDN, there's an incredible amount of stuff that's automatically happening in the network. In our environment, you actually have complete C, Java, Python, Perl, Puppet, Chef control over everything that's going on in the network. So this makes it easier to maintain a data center? Or? It's easier to maintain mm -hmm. and program both. I think what Robert was trying to say um, and was mentioning the C and Java part, right? So the goal here is that your network, first of all, is very programmable, and you can use your standard tools like GCC, mm -hmm. GDB, to develop applications and program the network. And second of all, a new class of applications come up, basically, which weren't before available before, right? So like moving virtual machines around? Moving virtual machines, tracking them from network point of view, understanding uh, where they're moving, the life of a VM, like Robert, for instance, you want to bring your infrastructure in. I mean, you are running a video here. Mm -hmm. You're literally a TV station, basically, right? Let's say you know people are very interested in this. All of a sudden, 50 people, instead of 50 people, 5,000 people want to watch it continuously, right? And it's a HD video that's going to get delivered. So you want to reprovision your network along with your server and storage very quickly, and you are serving it out of virtual machines. So you want to 
change the entire infrastructure to say, hey, deal with this, right? I want all my resources to go towards serving these videos up, basically. And you want to do that with a click on button or very simple stuff. And that's what we are trying to enable here that, you know, you have program programmatic control over the network. You already had that over server, right? So now the network is also under your control. So you can do end-to-end -end changing of application scale or rejigging your infrastructure to do what you are trying to set up to do. Does this also let you uh, build new kinds of networks? Like uh, if I was at a pharma company, I might want to really have my data segmented because of HIPAA com yes. compliance or stuff Absolutely. like that. Absolutely, you get an unprecedented level all the way down to layer two and how MAC addresses are handled and so forth. No communication sort of happens underneath you without you knowing about it. You know about any time somebody's trying to do something new and you get a decision of should I allow it or should I not? Should I do a compliance? Should I do an audit trail on it? What, what's the cost difference? You know, it, it lay out the cost. So, because you know how uh, yeah, the point here yeah. bosses you decide on things. No, they, I, I they, was they just probably say, have a, a grid of performance yeah. versus cost, and they decide uh, on. Robert what deals with a lot of the business side as well, basically. So instead of him saying the cost, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to tell you. This is the merchant silicon based stuff. Mm -hmm. This is the similar price points as servers, basically, right? And and this is one big driving focus of all this industry is that you know how do you move the value from the underlying hardware to actually more software basically right so one of the big things we are trying to achieve here is that you know the world of networking today is built on cables and physical hardware and we are trying to make it so simple and programmable where instead of just dealing with cables and physical hardware you're now dealing with operating systems and applications that help you achieve what you want. And it's all at the server scale, server pricing, and server application pricing points, basically. Yeah. So in other words, we are very, very reasonable. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, just, you know, I think a lot of when Sunay saying that stuff is a lot of things in the networking world are built around 60 to, with cables transceivers, 90 plus percent margins. The server world where we've come from and where we feel like networking is going to, operates at 15 to 25 percent margins and you know those sound like small differences in terms of percentage but when you actually look at it that causes the price difference to be 4x in terms of the actual street price so we're operating at that low price point on the hardware side with the extra value on the software side right yep. and and you know i mean we build our own server switch which lets you do unique stuff and obviously we charge some margin for that basically but if we are running on odm boxes that are coming from first we're not trying to add money on top of that basically right yeah. so we are supporting there and we are just adding software and so on and so forth for top to make it run like a traditional network here's where i'm at a disadvantage to like a cto who really knows what they're talking about yeah because <laughs> uh, i know the industry at a yeah. Yeah. level deep yeah you know what 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 is uh you know uh, the guys at Amazon or the guys at Microsoft or the guys at, at Google or, or, the, or our Rackspace data center buyers, what, how are they going to decide between So actually, you know, I'll take this one because this is actually more of a software question because when yeah. you talk with Amazon and Rackspace and some of the big guys, the hardware goes out of the equation because a lot of them just say, I'm going to get my, software, my hardware myself, right? So it really becomes a software question. And there, I would say the 30,000 foot level is we believe our operating system, which is NetVisor OS, which is a shortened version of a network hypervisor operating system. It's an OS that you know, runs distributed across all of your switches that are running it inside of your data center. That OS is hands down the best networking OS in the industry. That's a statement that we feel like we can defend, no question on the technical side. See, the reason Robert okay. said that is because well, he I wouldn't say it that strongly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny thing, Sinead's background is software, my background is hardware. We, affinity for each other because I have true respect for great software and he <laughs> loves great hardware. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> stuff runs faster on great yes. hardware. That's I exactly, actually, you said it, I right? Put, I, I put, mean, if you my don't money know. where my mouth is. When I did my PhD in electrical engineering, I also did a PhD minor in CS just because of how much I respected computer science. Anyway, I'm kind of a closet programmer. Yeah. Um, what would be the kinds of questions that a, a CTO would ask you guys to try to differentiate so the, and decide on whether they're going to go on with you? Because this uh, is a big investment, right? These yeah, data centers yeah. now are right. So, so like Robert, we, we a, have uh, even Rackspace, which is you know not the biggest, has hundreds of thousands of servers. Now, you, right? you asked a very very loaded question, basically, right? And you 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 presuppose that with 
you know, the big deployment as well. And I just want to start with saying that it's not just Amazons and Googles and Rackspace which are looking at this trend, right? We are seeing this trend yes. in the enterprises, we are seeing this trend in the ISPs, we are seeing this trend in the service provider, and we are engaged with all of those basically, right? So the, the interesting part is the question comes in differently based on who they are, right? Some of the bigger players because they are so involved in the saving the actual hardware cost, our discussions are totally built around the software, basically, right? They negotiate the pricing for the hardware. We provide the operating system for their their um, hardware they negotiate. And, you know, the discussion with us is how do you make that hardware run more efficiently? It's same as, you know, you buy your server from Supermicro, basically, and then you're going to get your Linux, and you focus on value with Linux, and you're talking to the Linux guy separately from the Supermicro. So similar model, basically, right? But in the enterprise space and in some of the service provider space, these guys use the network to get advantage because their goal is, unless the application works better, they're not going to make money, basically, yeah. right? So they are looking at network as a differentiator. They are looking at network as uh, something that will add value to their application and simplify their operating model, basically. Y you had a demo or something, I, I think. I was Did just setting up for that. Yeah. So we, should we bring it on? Yeah, please do. Let me have one over there. What have, are you going to show us? Uh, let me show you. So I'm going to jump into our dev network, basically that is in Palo Alto, and we're gonna get live into some of our switches that run our infra entire infrastructure. Okay. One thing we ensured from early days, for two years now, we have been running totally on our own, own gear, right? Our entire office runs on our own gear, and this is how we've been successful in our beta program where people are paying for our beta, basically, right? Dog food, right? <laughs> yep, yes. yes. So I'm logged into what looks like a server, right? I mean, you can actually see uh, typical, it's a dual socket machine with multiple cores and so on and so forth. You can run top and you can see this is a 64 gig machine with all the processes and all. But the interesting part is this is really a switch basically, right? Anytime you want, you type CLI and you're into the switch side basically. You can start doing something very simple, a port show, and you can see every port that exists on the network, right? So Aquila 12 is name of the switch port 9, you can see what is the IP address, port 9, another IP address, so it looks like there's a server connected on that port running a bunch of VMs, right? You see those VMs right here itself, right? So let me reduce the font a little bit so I can fit all this in one line. Okay, much better, Perfect. right? And, and you can see that basically what VLAN it is on, what VXLAN it is on, uh, whether it's a host or not, all that is visible light right here. You can actually go down, you can see Aquila 12 is connected to Aquila 2. Uh, it's a auto trans. So remember I said that we are trying to simplify all the cabling and all? Yeah. In our world, you just need more bandwidth between two switches, walk over, find two empty ports, plug a cable, walk away. Nothing to do, even if trunking, pathing, all that is automatic here, right? Yeah. If you keep going down, you will see the other switches in the fabric. So one of the things we are trying to support is the network as one logical network, right? Get away from virtual and physical network being separate entity, right? So you can treat your entire stuff as one logical network, and that's what you start seeing here, right? If, if we have mixtures of Cisco boxes and then some of your boxes, uh, can we still Get some that is an excellent question. Mm -hmm. You said you're not like a CTO, but now you're talking <laughs> like a total CTO. <laughs> so, so that's a very deep question, Robert, because we actually do get a lot of questions around there, basically, right? Um, so our, our protocols are very open protocols. We use standard TCP IP to talk to each other. We use server-style clustering to connect to each other. So reality is you can have Cisco switches in the core, and we actually recommend leaving the core network alone, and we just work through the core network without any issue, right? Hmm. I, I wanted to show you yeah. one more thing since we are on the demo, basically. Actually, before you hit return on that, one thing that's useful to point out here is you see status of these machines over here. Yeah. All this information, LLDP, DHCP, so forth, this is information that we know about the machines that are connected to the network without putting agents on them. And the reason this is such a powerful place to be in the network seeing the traffic go by is because 
we see the machines going out there in order to get services and so forth, so we can actually determine what's happening inside of a server essentially without going inside of it. It makes us very open and compatible to whatever open stack or you know, cloud stack or VMware or whatever you're running, or even physical machines that you're running on the other side. This helps you debug uh, what yeah, problems yeah. that are Total going Total visibility. On. Total visibility. This is exactly what another application we are showing on our, on our own OS. It's yeah. analytics and logging basically, right? So does, this, yeah. does this help uh, build a more secure network? It yes. builds a more secure network, builds a more programmable network. Because if somebody was trying to attack your network, would you be able to see more data about yes. the network? Totally, totally. Yes. Every connection is visible. So l l l let me walk you through a live okay. example, right? So you see we, we are seeing these client talking to the server. What is the service? What is the average latency they are seeing is right here. How many bytes are going through? This was zero second away. This is real time. You keep going, you can see the older data right here. Basically, this is nine second, 11 second. And yep. we go back in time, right? So a lot of it is historical data is there. We keep it memory mapped. We put it in our Fusion IO disk for analysis. And this is why your box has, uh, what, 100 gigs? How, how many gigs of uh, So the boxes, is? they can go from as low as we have boxes that you know do 8 or 16 gigs of memory, and then we have available options. If you care about the analytics and want really deep inspection of everything, then you just bump it up to 64, 128 gigs. We can even go up to 512 and a terabyte on one of the boxes. Very cool. Right, so, so to go walk through the example that you're talking about, all I did was I said connection show within last 20 seconds, right? I want to see everything in the network within last 20 seconds. And we are seeing a lot of these things like 10.9.10.200 talking to this something with a higher average latency, right? Now I can tell you just looking at the IP address, this is a client talking to something outside. But if you want to see what else is it doing, so you just do this, you say connection show. Uh, you right. notice the CLI is very easy. You just hit tab, you get to the next word, the next word. So yep. it's a restful, it's a restful CLI. You just type a command Unix style. You know, whatever you're gonna type, you type one command, you're not in a mode, it executes, it gives you the information back. That's why it's a fundamentally scriptable API. Yep. So we turned it around. Now we are looking at this client, which all server does it talk to? And we can go down and we are now seeing what are the servers this guy talked to, right? You can actually pick in one of the servers and say, okay, why is this guy talking to this server so much? So you can just say uh, connection show, right? And say server IP, and I'm just gonna put the server here, right? Yeah. And then immediately you see who else talks to this guy. Looks like this particular client talks a lot to this particular server, basically, right? Yeah. But you're seeing their average latency, you're seeing all this stuff. Um, and where this is coming from is our flow capability, right? SDN is about flows. What does that mean, flow? So right. flow is anything how you <coughs> identify a set of packets on the network, right? So somehow, you know, I can tie a flow saying, Robert's packet on the network is a flow, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not going into the virtual network side of the th thing, but you can create a virtual network here and say anything belonging to Robert is a flow, which is Robert's flow, Got right? It. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what client, what server, what IP, based on VLAN, based on VXLAN, based on service you run, we can create a flow out of you. So but you can see if I do, let's say you were building this for Facebook, yep. when I do a Facebook request, yep. that data totally. goes from, you know, comes from 100,000 right. different totally. servers and you That's can right. see where what, it's going, yeah. where it's the, as it jumps yeah, through so the network. It's like a distributed version of Wireshark yeah. in a sense. Wireshark would be on a single machine, but the idea here is that the flow is passing through potentially dozens of hardware boxes and it may be layer two, it may be layer three, it may go into tunnels for VXLAN and so forth. And the point is being able to identify the flow no matter where it is as it passes through the network. But the, the part I was also If somebody added uh, 20 new machines to your network today. You'll mm -hmm. see it immediately. Yeah. You'll see You'll it. get a call back. In fact, what you can do is I'm gonna quit out of the CLI and I'm, the, I'm going into a scripting mode, the same command we were typing through CLI. I'm yeah. just gonna type it here and it immediately returns you all the data basically, right? So you wanna start doing Scripting, choose your shell. You can say while one, right? We are talking about monitoring. We just say this and sleep every five seconds, and you say end. And every five seconds, this is now gonna keep repeating basically, right? So notice how easily I transition between programming, scripting level programming 
into uh, CLI and so on and so forth. Switching into C and Java is equally simple because mm -hmm. what we keep is our data structures and command and arguments all consistent. We are fully multi-threaded when it comes to programming the switch. Yep. So you can actually switch between any mode that you want basically and to your example, you can easily monitor what's going on and you know, put it in your own files, log files, and monitor it and see what is different. Nah, that's cool. And but how long does it take to, to learn this new world compared to if you were running a, a, a Cisco switch today? I, how long does it so take to learn? Th that is how, a very excellent part. All right? the so, stuff that you can do. So we bought a lot of stuff very similar to from the server side, basically, right? So people who are familiar with doing stuff on the server side, orchestration side. This just makes so simple for them. But by putting a CLI there, which actually lets you deal with ports, like very simple configuring VLAN across the fabric. You can see every VLAN here. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have VXLAN configured here. Let me see if we have any. Now you guys are a new company. I, the, uh, do you have customers at a big scale using this yet? or? Because you, know, we you probably need the social proof to <laughs> yeah. prove that this stuff actually works. At a, yeah, we have customers. Know, uh, what we found is that customers try out kind of a pair of boxes, two to four boxes. And then after that, the next step is they want to get into pods that are 10, 20, and the step after that is in the hundreds. And we've taken customers up that ramp at this point. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think a really you know, important point for the people who are used to being on the NetOps side is that fundamentally, even though we show a lot of stuff that's programmability, other advanced capability, the first thing you do with the box is you can just replace your you know, non-intelligent layer two, layer three switch, and just run the commands to set it up very similar to what you're used to right now. And in a sense, you can then take the baby steps of now the box has the extra capability, learn it and use it. The first time you have a problem, go in and learn about the debugging, start putting the flows, tap, see what happened in your network. And you, what you find is you have Gigamon type capability, software defined just all over your network right away. That's cool. Uh, tell me a little bit about your company. How, uh, how was it funded and uh, how many people are working there? So uh, we started uh, about four years ago now and we've done three rounds of financing. Um, total of about $45 million has been raised. And uh, like Sine was saying, we're doing you know a launch tomorrow, but we've been in a couple dozen customers for the last two years doing betas and kind of you know stealth mode, going into production with them and so forth. Um, you know, we're a well-sized company at this point. We have, you know, a good number of software engineers, some hardware. We have relationships with a couple ODMs already over in, uh, in Asia. Um, so we're good to go. Very cool. Where do I learn more about it? Uh, pluribusnetworks.com. Um, you know, you'll go there, you'll see everything. Um, tomorrow we are launching, so you will see a lot more details. Yeah, in the past, it'll happen in the past. It'll happen in the, the video past. Yes. You will have seen that we launched already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, well, cool. This is good stuff, and uh, thanks for what you're doing for the for the uh, cloud and network, the data center worlds. Right? Hey, totally appreciate yeah. that, Robert. It's people like you who help promote this uh, new world of technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thanks. you. Great.